I'd like to present Tracy Payne, who also got her PhD under Spotsier at Michigan. And um, uh, I first met her at Washington University, where she was a postdoc. And then um, she's now at Idaho State University. Mm -hmm. And she'll be speaking on least sphere geometry and generalized Voronoi diagrams. Well, thank you for uh, to the organizers for putting on this conference and for inviting me. This is my first in-person mm -hmm. conference since before the pandemic. And it's just wonderful to be with old friends and new friends, a great size of group where I feel less nervous because I kind of know everybody here. Um, so thanks, this is great. So um, the origin of this um, is actually in the pandemic when I was feeling really lonely, when I was self-isolating. And I started doing a student project with an undergrad who was a math major. And I had previously lived with a computer science professor, that's John Edwards, doing a problem in computational um, Lie algebras. And so the student was a double math, double CS major. So I asked my former collaborator, do you want to co-advise this thesis? And he said, sure. And I said, well, since I picked last time, you can pick this time. Mm -hmm. And so he picked generalized Voronoi diagrams. And I knew absolutely nothing about Voronoi diagrams when I started this project. Um, so yeah, John is in CS at Utah State and Egan was a double math, double CS major from ISU. So here's um, a picture of a classical Voronoi diagram where we have 50 points. They look like spheres, they're, but they're supposed to be points <laughs> scattered in this box. And um, we have subdivided the domain here based on which of the red dots is closest. Okay, so for example, pushing right thing. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So here's this dot, and all of these dots, these points here, are closer to this red dot than any other red dot, right? And for example, along this blue line segment, those are the points equidistant from these two. Okay, so um, it's not quite a partition, um, but these regions only overlap in their boundaries. Okay, and um, this go, this idea goes back quite a ways. It was first seen in um, the work of Descartes and it's in the work of Voronoi and Blaschka. And I'm not the greatest historian of this subject because it's a field new to me and I've been <laughs> trying to learn. So here's a formal definition. We have S, a set of N points. Um, we call these sites. Uh, the Voronoi cell or Voronoi region for a point PK in this set <laughs> is the set of points X in R2, so that the distance from X to that point PK, whose cell it is, is less than or equal to the distance from X to any other point in that set. Okay, And people sometimes refer to Voronoi diagram as kind of the picture I showed you, the subdivision with the wedges. Um, but in general, if you try to generalize this, you have to be a little careful about the definition that you make. And the right uh, kind of formal setting for generalizations of this is to say that this is a minimization diagram for the set of distance functions. So what a minimization diagram is, it's where you have a set of functions, and um, it's really, I've tried to explain this and it's easiest to draw a picture um, rather than throw around a bunch of quantifiers. You might have some functions like this and you look where say this function is minimal, right? And you can say that's function one. You assign the set where that function is minimal with the singleton set one. This point is where the minimum value is but obtained by the functions one and two, right? So for all possible subsets of the index set, you get a region in your domain where the minimal values are obtained by those functions, okay? So you can think of the Voronoi diagram as a minimization diagram for a set of distance functions. 
Okay. And in the classical, the um, Voronoi diagram, um, the dominance region for one point over the another point, PI over PJ, that is the set of points closer to PI than to PJ, is just a half space, right? And then if you take the Voronoi cell for PI, that will be the intersection of half spaces, right? Points closer to PI than any other PJ. So then you'll get a, a polytope. And the boundary of the cell will then be um, points uh, like that line segment I showed you, it will consist of line segments. And those line segments are subsets of you know, perpendicular bisectors of line segments between two points. And they're subsets of equidistant sets, right? Okay. Um, the hard part of the problem is not in describing the equidistant sets, um, if you change the geometry, say. Really, the hard part of the problem is determining the adjacency relations of the cells. Okay. okay. And I won't talk about um, Delaunay triangulations, but in case you're familiar with them, the Delaunay triangulation is dual to the Voronoi diagram. So ways that you can generalize um, Voronoi diagram, you can change the underlying geometry. You can take hyperbolic space or a sphere or whatever kind of manifold you want. You could take a taxi cab metric. You can allow your sites to be sets other than point sets. Like you could make them polygons um, or disks. Okay. You can weight sites to allow um, one, points have greater gravity than other points. And instead of looking at the closest point, you could subdivide based on the furthest point, right? Instead of taking the set of all points closest that have P1 as closest, you can take the set of all points that have P1 as the furthest point. Or you could subdivide based on which two points are closest, right? So for any point in the x, y, in your domain, look and see which two points are closest. Take those indices and make a cell for those. Okay. And you can minimize functions other than distance functions, like the, the power function in Mobius geometry. Um, and applications, um, when you minimize other functions than uh, distance functions. One type of function you can minimize is what's called a divergence function, or uh, there are other names for them, a pseudo distance, I think. And I wasn't looking for it, but these are functions used in geometric inference, which is kind of a hot topic now, where you're trying to take a point cloud, a, you know, a set of data points that are measured with some degree of uncertainty and fix a manifold structure to them, say, and in that field, they, they use um, generalized Voronoi diagrams where instead of using distance, they use these divergence functions. Okay. Uh, generalized Voronoi diagrams are, or even the classical Voronoi diagrams are just ubiquitous. If you try to search for, you know, <laughs> trying to fill in your background on Voronoi diagrams, you come across thousands of papers in all kinds of disciplines. Um, and a lot of times things have different names because people call them different things in different fields. They're also called Beeson polygons, for example. Um, and one application is in um, plants, uh, in, in biology, when you think about planting some seeds and you let the roots expand, but then when one root system runs into another root system, it will kind of stop growing, right? And they, the root systems won't interlace. And so the pattern of roots for plants can form a Voronoi-like uh, diagram. And so one explanation is for, for why there are so many Voronoi diagrams in nature is that this is a growth model where you have some type of radial growth. And I'll show you uh, an animation of this. Okay. 
So I just think this is the coolest animation. I'm gonna play it again, just because I think it's so cool. So you have like, these little seeds that are being planted and each seed grows radially and it stops growing when it encounters another seed. Okay. Another disc. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is related to crystal growth. Mm -hmm. Okay, how do I get back? All right. So, so you think they all grew at the same speed, I guess? They do. And actually, that's a really interesting problem. Um, like Ben Schmidt and Mira Meinfar have worked on this problem of growth contests, where they will take um, two points in different types of domains and let them both grow radially, but at different rates, and see if it's possible for the dom domain of one to be unbounded or something like that. I, I'm, that's my memory. I didn't check it before I prepared this talk. And I actually found a quite old computer science paper where they did the same thing, um, animated or tried to solve for crystal growth with different growth rates. And they didn't do it in a smart way. They just didn't. I mean, they didn't use PDEs to find the shape of the regions that you get. Um, they just used computer approximations. Um, I don't know if, if there anyone has used differential equations to solve that kind of problem. Okay, another application is a famous story in epidemiology with the cholera outbreak in London in 1854, where um, John Snow thought that the cholera um, cases might be tied to water supply. And so he made a map of London and mapped out all the different pumps and then he subdivided London based on which um, pump was closest and then mapped the cholera cases over that and uh, diagnosed, you know, found that they were clustered around one, one particular pump, the Broad Street pump. So he was an early um, user of Voronoi diagrams. Another application is in um, navigation in robotics where um, you can imagine a robot might want to move through that um, cloud of red dots that I had on the first screen and would want to avoid the red dots as if they were obstacles. And it would make sense to try to stay as far away as possible from the obstacles. So the robot would want to stay on the blue edges to navigate its way through uh, the obstacles. Okay. Another example is, you know, when you're using your cell phone, your cell phone looks, your cell phone looks for the nearest cell tower and connects to the network that way. And I could go on and on and on. There are all kinds of applications, um, even like, you know, those models of molecules where it looks like little spheres kind of bundled together to make a model of an atom. Um, those are made with a version of Voronoi diagram. Okay. So from the point of view of my collaborator, John, he was his interest was to find an efficient algorithm for computing generalized Voronoi diagrams. So his goal was to write programs that would run efficiently and give us output, okay? And um, the, in the classical problem, the computation time is order n log n. And there are a couple different out, or at least, three algorithms that um, will compute the classical Voronoi diagram in that time. Okay. Um, and one of those is the one that, that I'll talk about today. And it's a problem that boils down to computing the intersection of half spaces, which in computer science is equivalent to computing the convex hull of points. So I, I will say convex hull problem when I mean half space intersection problem. Okay. And so if you can encode a problem as a convex hull problem um, in dimension D, I wrote the computation time there, and that is considered to be really good, uh, uh, efficient compared to other methods. <laughs> okay, and there's a program, um, Q-hole, built in that you can call from Python to compute convex hulls. Okay, and um, I'm... The, the first time that this convex hull approach was used for computing classical Voronoi diagrams was a paper in 1979 by Brown. And um, 
he didn't fully explain kind of why it was working, but he, you know, really analyzed the mathematics behind the method. But he he stated the method and it it did work. Later on, Aaron Hammer and Edel Spruner wrote a paper really kind of breaking things down. And I I, sh I haven't read this paper, so maybe I should be quiet. But <laughs> and then after this, there were all kinds of um, generalizations where people would take some generalization of the Voronoi diagram, like having spherical sites or using um, a power distance instead of regular distance between spheres or weighting sites, order K Voronoi diagrams, Bregman divergence, these kind of things. And they would find some way to do a change of variables, go into a dimension higher, something like that, and convert the problem to a convex hull problem. Okay. So lots of these generalized Voronoi diagrams are convex hull problems. Okay. And um, going back to Delaunay, um, people did think about Voronoi diagrams in terms of spaces of spheres, which is what I'll talk about next. And um, I think the earliest reference that looks at these spaces of spheres, or that explains it, I guess, in terms of, in a, in a clear way, applying the space of spheres um, in a sophisticated way to Voronoi diagrams. This is a paper from 92 by, I think these people are in computer science. But what we'll do today is we'll um, take and unify all of these pre previous convex hull problems, so they follow from one big theorem, and we'll generalize um, so that the theorem will apply to other types of Voronoi diagrams as well. Um, so there will be a single framework. And instead of using Mobius geometry, we'll use least sphere geometry. Okay. So, um, we talked, we heard about moduli spaces yesterday, but to remind you, moduli space is a set that indexes some class of geometric objects. So you can think about the moduli space of circles in R2, right? And you can imagine taking the center of a circle and its radius. So that will determine the circle. So you can imagine R2 cross the positive numbers, a three dimensional set to parameterize circles in R2. You can add orientation to the circle by allowing a negative radius. So where positive radius could be outward oriented and negative radius could be inward oriented. So then you have a center and a non-negative number. So that's a three-dimensional set, right? R3 minus a, the XY plane. And then it's natural to fill in that hole, allow radius zero. So you have a moduli space of oriented circles and um, points, which is identified with R3 in a pretty obvious way. So it's a three-dimensional set. But now, what you might also want to do is add a point at infinity. And you might also want to add oriented hyperplanes, because oriented hyperplanes can be viewed as a limit of um, circles of larger and larger radii, right? And so there, my simple um, description ends, right? There's not an easy way to, to attach the point at infinity and the oriented hyperplanes to R3, um, at least <laughs> by waving my hands up here. And this is what least sphere geometry does. Okay? In least sphere geometry, you have moduli space, which consists of points in RB, a point at infinity, um, oriented spheres, and oriented hyperplanes, okay? And they're parameterized by points on the Lie quadric. This is a three-dimensional um, hypersurface in four-dimensional projective space. Um, and when, you're, when you set it up this way, the Lie quadric is in four-dimensional projective space. So you have a natural topology. So it makes sense to say that this oriented hyperplane is the limit of these circles. Um, you furthermore have a semi-Riemannian inner product. Um, so you can take the inner product of a hyperplane and a 
sphere and get a number. Um, and um, the lead group O23 acts transitively on a space, or I should say it, it's associated with the lead group O23. And I'm a lead group person, and I have not really used or explored the lead group structure of O23 as it applies to this at all. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel a little guilty not, not looking at that. Are so you saying the V4 <laughs> is complex projective or, or real projective? Real projective. Okay. Yeah, everything's okay. real. Yeah. yeah. And so I was kind of trying to say, like, we have a three dimensional moduli space, and I'm arguing you have a three dimensional hypersurface in P4. The quadratic form has signature two three. That's what you think? Yep. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So yeah, I'll get to that. But yeah, so that's on R5 and P4 is a quotient. Okay. So I'll come back to the uh, least sphere geometry. Mm -hmm. But um, this is kind of, this is the slide that's at the heart of the talk. Like <laughs> I keep, it, it, I have to explain this slide really, really well for you to understand uh, kind of the takeaway. And um, so this is just the close up of the classical Voronoi diagram in R2, right? We have the three red sites um, and then the Voronoi, you've got three Voronoi cells, right? And, um, Okay, right. So all of these points are closest to this red red point here. These guys are equidistant to these two. This point is equidistant to all three, right? It's on the boundary of the three cells. So because um, this point is equidistant to all three, right? Um, and those are the closest points in the Voronoi diagram, that means that there's this hollow sphere um, that has this guy at the center, and these three sites are incident to it, right? And because the sphere is hollow, those are the closest points among all of our sites. Um, all three are incident to that common sphere, right? So that's telling you that this guy is um, in all three Voronoi cells, okay? And I wish I had drawn um, some more circles on this picture, so you just have to imagine them. Okay, so imagine these points here. These points are where two distance functions are simultaneously minimized, the distance to this point and this point, right? And the way you can characterize these points here, let's say that you have this point, there's a circle centered at this point, which is hollow, and it has these two incident to it, right? Okay. <laughs> Down here in this part of the cell, take this point, right? You imagine taking a sphere, uh, that point, and enlarging it, it until you hit one of your sites, and your sphere centered at that point is no longer hollow, right? And what's going to happen is you hit this point first. So there's going to be a hollow sphere right here, incident to just one point, okay? So, okay. To recap, okay. I, I, I should say one more thing that um, the the sphere centered at this point. Um, what I want to say is that you have these sphere. You have spheres here that are hollow, right? But they're not incident to any of the sites. Right, you can enlarge them or make them smaller, and they stay hollow. Right, they're in the interior of the space of hollow spheres. The points that we're interested in are the spheres where they stop being hollow. Right, where they suddenly become incident to one of the sites. So those are points on the boundary of the space of hollow spheres. Okay, so. The boundaries of your Voronoi cells are coming from extremal hollow spheres when they stop being hollow. Okay. And furthermore, you know, I talked over here about in minimization diagrams that how these regions are indexed by subsets of your index set. You also have that um, poset structure um, on your hollow spheres based on which sites are incident to the, the sphere. 
Does that make sense? This is the really the crucial slide. <laughs> okay. So the Voronoi diagram corresponds to imagining that you're in the space of spheres and only looking at hollow spheres and finding the extremal hollow spheres that are incident to one or more sites. Okay. Then once you find those spheres, you're not quite done because you have to take the center of the sphere to get the point on the, the Voronoi diagram. Okay. So the vertices are centers of hollow, hollow spheres incident to three or more sites. The edges are centers of hollow spheres incident to two or more sites. And points are centers of hollow spheres incident to exactly one site. So it, it turns out that you can define many other generalized Voronoi diagrams in the same way um, through properties of um, extremal properties in the space of hollow spheres. Okay. So you can imagine that you, know, you have poly polygonal regions, and if you have a point equidistant between two polygons, there will be a hollow sphere that suddenly touches one point on one polygon and one point on the other polygon. Okay, and um, there are other, even other problems, like, for example, there's a problem in computational geometry where you have a point cloud, and you want to find the thinnest annulus that contains the point cloud. You can also formulate that in terms of hollow spheres. Okay, so I decided to sh show some pictures first, applications of the theorem before the theorem. So here's a farthest point Voronoi diagram. And the farthest point, um, well, maybe I should explain first. Like, I, it throws me off if I think too hard about this, but mm -hmm. <laughs> like, if you have this point here, the set of points that have that as the farthest point are going to be over here. Right? Or if you have this point here, the points having that as the farthest point are over there, right? So a site is no longer in its own cell. <laughs> And the way you can characterize this is, um, for example, let's say you have, can't quite see the circle where the centers are. I think this is the center of a circle. Um, how do you find the furthest point from the site? You want to take the least hollow sphere, right? You want to take a really, really large sphere and contract it until it becomes incident to one or more points, right? And so this point here is such that when I take this sphere and contract it, it's going to be incident to three sides. Therefore, it's going to form the uh, a vertex of the farthest point Voronoi diagram. Okay. Okay. So these spheres are not hollow. They're their exterior is hollow. You could think of reversing the orientation if you like. Okay, you can have spherical sites. So here, what we're looking at um, for our distance functions is the distance to a disk, really. Um, I'm not working inside these circles at all. So I'm really thinking of them as disks. And the set of, if you have two um, disks of different radii, or circles of different radii, uh, the equidistant set is going to be a hyperbola. So these are pictures of the blue curves are pieces of branches of hyperbolas. So you start with the circles and then you build the Voronoi diagram for Bola. Yep. Uh -huh. And this is the same idea that um, of hollow spheres that like if at this point there is a hollow sphere that is incident to these three red mm -hmm. spheres and the way it's incident is that it's in it's tangent to them okay and this is a crucial point that in Mobius geometry you cannot really detect tangency in Laguerre geometry you can detect tangency of spheres with a linear condition really and so by using um Lee sphere geometry Lee sphere geometry incorporates Mobius geometry and Laguerre geometry so you can detect tangency in a tangency of spheres in a nice way okay so um yeah that's that's for spherical sites 
right? Um, here's the medial axis again, and you can describe the medial axis um, as the set of all, all of the, the medial axis is a set. So our data is going to be a set of half spaces here that form a polygon. And we want to find the medial axis, which is this, these, these red segments. And those are the centers of hollow spheres that are tangent to the boundary in two or more locations. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's exactly the same as the previous slide. If you think of a circle as the same as a line. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So funny things can happen when you compute generalized Voronoi diagrams. Um, this is an example where we have three spheres, the red ones, those are our sites. And you have these two different points being um, equidistant um, from these three spheres, right? And I always get confused on this slide. Um, that's why I wrote this note to myself here. Um, yeah, this is. Yeah. So you start with the three red circles. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Anyway, this is, I, I'm going to get myself confused, but um, you can have a cell. This is not what you'll see in a classical Voronoi diagram, right? A cell with two vertices, right? So you can have a cell with two vertices, you can have empty cells. Um, you can have disconnected cells. So there are qualitatively different properties that cells can have for generalized Voronoi diagrams. Okay, so we started playing around here and decided to take um, sites as being unions of spheres. So here, one of our sites is the union of these three spheres and this one. Okay. You start um, with those. Four brown circles. Yep. Mm -hmm. And here we allow the spheres to overlap. Okay. And this one, this is one site with three spheres. And we're kind of imagining, you know, modeling, having a robot moving around, and you wanted to model the obstacles with shapes that are union of spheres. So, anyway, um, this is the type of diagram we came up for that example. Okay. Uh, this is a power diagram. Um, rho is a inner product on the space of spheres. Maybe it's, it's called the power um, function, or something. I think it's also called the Rubius inner product. And when you use this inner product on the space of spheres, equidistant um, sets, the set of points equidistant from two spheres will be um, linear. Okay. Mm -hmm. So now I'm coming back to the Lie quadrant. And here's the formal definition. Um, it is the null cone for that um, semi-Riemannian inner product, signature 2-3 that we wrote down. And so it's a set of points in projective space of dimension D plus three, where I'm initially looking at points in RD. So now I'm in D plus three and I projectivize and I'm looking at the null cone here, okay? That set of points is called the Lie quadric. And it is the moduli space of oriented spheres um, and hyperplanes. I'm actually allowing a point at infinity, and I'm thinking of points as um, spheres of radius zero. Okay. And since we were doing computations, um, trying to program things, we it really did not want to work with points in projective space. And so we always picked some standard coordinates. So a lot of our proofs are done in standard coordinates because that's what we were, how we were thinking about things. Okay. Now this inner product does not descend to projective space um, for numerical values, but positivity, negativity, and having value zero will be preserved when we multiply by scalars. So we have this inner product on the Lie quadric that makes sense for positive, negative, or zero. Okay, and um, for history, um, 
I took, I learned all about least sphere geometry from the book by uh, Tom Cecil. And um, I, actually the second time I heard about least sphere geometry was when I was a postdoc at WashU and I heard Gary Jensen and Kuo Shin Chi giving talks about how they were applying um, least sphere geometry to um, isoparametric height for surfaces with four prin principal curvatures. Okay, So this is just in Riemannian geometry where you might want to think of a surface, say, as an envelope of spheres of varying radii. And actually the first place I heard of Lee sphere geometry was when I was in graduate school and another student was doing a, a thesis on in computational geometry. And this is real, this is implemented in computational and geometry modeling packages. Like if you model an object with a primitive, like a cone union with a um, plane, right? And you wanna smooth out these um, places where the connections are not C2, right? What you can do is take a ball, kind of roll it around the bottom of your cone where it touches the plane, and that surface that it sweeps out is a piece of a um, degree four hypersurface called a Dupin C cleave. So um, that's where I first heard of um, least sphere geometry. Okay. All right. So now um, there's actually a more natural way to de define um, the Lie quadric. You know, where you can kind of build it up from a, you know, embed use stereographic projection to get RD into a sphere at a point at infinity and, and so forth. But for the sake of time, I'll just tell you the end of the story, which is that after um, what, this is the correspondence in the end. So my claim is that um, these are all of our least spheres, points, point at infinity, oriented spheres where a negative radius reverses your orientation. And th this is an oriented hyperplane, okay? And an oriented hyperplane is determined by a unit normal n and a height h, okay? So every Lie sphere is of one of these four types, okay? And so um, I claim then that you can partition the Lie quadrant into these four sets, okay? And you can see here points, a point U in RD appears right here. You have a zero in the last spot. So that zero, so when I take the signature, it's minus, plus, 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 minus, okay? And the first part um, is Mobius geometry, where you ignore that last coordinate with a ne negative sign on the inner product. So right here, like if we take just the objects with zero at the end, you're working in Mobius geometry, where you have a point and a point at infinity, okay? Um, but then when we allow a negative uh, non-zero radius in the last slot, that's where you introduce Laguerre geometry in the space of spheres. And so here is a sphere um, with center, oops, center, that should be a P. Um, center P, the center P occurs there. If the radius is zero, you get the same as your equation for a point. Um, so then you can see as the ra radius decreases to zero, you do approach that center point. Um, yeah, and the radius can be positive or negative. Okay. And then um, the points with a one here give you the, um, well, yeah. These, in this case, the sum of the first two coordinates is one. In this case, the sum of the first two coordinates is zero. So if the last coordinate is a one, and the sum of the first two coordinates is zero. That gives you um, the, the coordinates of an oriented hyperplane. Okay. So the, the Lie quadric is made up of these types of points, which parameterize our Lie spheres. Okay. So for the theorem, I wanted to talk about the main theorem, I guess. We kind of phrased this in a very accessible way because we're assuming some of the readers of this paper, which, oh, by the way, I should say work in progress, the paper I really had hoped to have on the archive last week, but it, I, it's really essentially written. Um, the, um, but I, we wanted to make this something that a computer scientist could read mm -hmm. <laughs> and understand. So um, it's kind of got a easily accessible description. 
So the idea is that each site is going to be replaced by a condition involving a lease here. Okay. So um, you will be given a set of points P plus, and the plus has to do with the condition that goes with those points. Like your sphere should have that point on the outside. Like P minus, you'll have a set of points and you'll be looking for spheres that have that point on the inside, okay? So these are encoding set of conditions that you wanna impose on the space of spheres, okay? So, you know, initially, you, what, from what we were talking about earlier, you could have just taken a set of points and said that you want spheres to be hollow with respect to those points. Okay. But so now we have five sets of data points, two sets of points, one set born into hyperplanes, and two sets of spheres. Okay. And we want to assume that at least one of these sets is non empty. Now we're going to look for the set of all spheres, generalization of hollow sphere. So um, we want the spheres to be, for all the points in P plus, those points should be either incident to or outside your sphere. The sets in P minus should be um, inside or incident to your sphere. Okay. Um, this is just saying that you want your sphere to be a subset of a half space. Like in the medial axis example, we only want to consider spheres that are inside the polygon. Okay, this last one is the inner product that we saw for the power function, the condition on the power function. And then the last one is just saying that um, we want spheres, the spheres we're looking for to be outside of the spheres in our data set. Did I lose you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So then what we want to do is look for the set of points that are centers of spheres that satisfy all these conditions. Okay. And those centers will be um, the centers that we need to consider for our generalized Voronoi diagram. Right. It's not quite that simple. If you think back to the first example, it wasn't enough to just look at hollow spheres. We also had to look at the way they were hollow, right? We also had to look at extremal hollow spheres and count how many points were incident to them. Okay. So, okay. What we want to do is find those spheres that meet our desired conditions. And those spheres, we're looking for them as they're described in the leak quadrant. So we're going to look for positively oriented spheres in the Lie quadrant that parameterize the spheres that satisfy our conditions. Okay. Then there is a polyhedral cone in Rd plus three. Okay, a, a set defined by a system of linear inequalities. Okay. Then that polyhedral cone will you can projectivize it, right? And to find the set of spheres that we're looking for, you just take that polyhedral cone and intersect it with the space of spheres. Look for the spheres in that polyhedral cone. So once you have that set of spheres, it's similar to what we were talking about in that very first simple slide that um, you need to take the center of the spheres. Then you need to do a finer analysis where you look at extremal spheres and look at a poset structure in the space of extremal spheres. Okay. Okay. And then, um, yeah, you have a duality between the minimization diagram and the post sets in your minimization diagram and the post sets in your poly polytope. Okay. So the key idea of the proof here um, is, okay, 
We have P being a point, S being an oriented hypersphere, H being an oriented hyperplane, NRD. Okay. Then we take Lie coordinates for the corresponding points in the Lie quadric, take standard coordinates. And then we have this table of equivalences, which is really amazing to me. This is kind of the beautiful, amazing, cool thing about Lie sphere geometry. The point P will be incident to the sphere, right? This is a second order condition in RD. Um, if and only if this inner product, first order condition in the Lie quadric holds. Okay, so you, you have point incident to the sphere over here in RD. You have um, orthogonal points in um, project in in the Lie quadric. Um, so you, incidence gives you zero inner zero product. Um, when P is interior to a sphere, you have the inner product being positive. Two spheres are in oriented tangency if their inner product is zero. And a hyperplane and a um, sphere are in oriented tangency if, um, if their inner product is zero. Okay. And you also have the, the power function built in here. The Mobius inner product can also be expressed in terms of the um, inner product. And when you're doing the inner product, you're mm -hmm. doing the inner product on all the projected space, right? And then restricting it to. Yeah. Well, and you, so you only can tell if it's positive or negative, right? Right. right. Or mm -hmm. zero. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So the big idea is that in least sphere geometry, the second order conditions in RD become linear conditions in RD plus three. Okay. Okay. So in that theorem, the inequalities that we need to define the polyhedron in uh, RD plus three are just the inequalities that I wrote in that table. Right. Okay. Um, and you can, in fact, take any system of inequalities that you want in um, RD plus three, right? <laughs> and compute a polyhedron and map it back to some spheres in RD and ask yourself, what do those mean, right? Okay. And that's how you get the order K Voronoi diagrams. Um, let's see. So this is a, a generalization of the first theorem that actually overlaps with it quite a bit. Um, and it's kind of just starting from the point of view, like that you're in um, the Lie quadrant and you can look at the restriction of any affine function from RD um, plus three to R, and then, um, you know, solve the system of inequalities and map it back. And what's different here is um, that, yeah, there's a, yeah. I guess it's, this is, um, you're not, starting out with these geometric conditions on extremal spheres, right? We're not talking about the space of spheres at all. Um, so mm -hmm. when you map the cone, it, it, mm -hmm. you're just making the image of a cone, but it might be as just a submanifold or something, right? But once you get into the cube or not. Oh, so what happens is this, this okay. explains What's going to happen? I don't know if this answers your question. I'm okay, just going to say okay. something. And, okay. But like um, that. Okay. So like the the faces of the polyhedron, you intersect them with your Lie quadric, and then you map them back, and that gives you the um, structure of your Voronoi diagram in RD. But what can happen is like you're in the Lie quadric is degree two. And that's why you're getting hyperbolas in some cases, is because you have to inter intersect the polyhedron with a quadrant surface. Is that what, what you're asking? No. Um, well, the cube parameterizes your different um, mm -hmm. areas, but uh, it, it, when you when you take that cone 
Because that's mm -hmm. giving you the and and you take the image of that coming inside cube. Mm -hmm. Right. That mm -hmm. it, it, is that what kind of set is that? Is those examples or or um uh, let's see a variety or something. Uh, yeah, it's just the intersection of a cone of a polytope and a quadric surface. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I, I yeah, yeah, I was just wondering if some of the uh, singularity went away at all, or I, when you take the image, but I don't know. <laughs> Never mind. Don't worry no, I don't <laughs> think it goes away. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There's a question I have here. Um, oh, okay. That's it. Well, this is the algorithm, but I think you can all figure out the algorithm from the process I just described. Um, and I'll use my remaining time um, to say some open questions. What if the sites are polygons just in R2? Um, and the problem is that um, sites formed, well, I, yeah, okay. <laughs> I won't go into that. Um, another question that Mohammed mentioned is um, finding the medial axis of a closed curve. And it was kind of satisfying. I was looking at an old version of this talk um, and I, oh, I still have more questions. Um, another question you can ask is, you know, what conditions give you empty cells? What connections give you disconnected cells? What conditions give you, you know, cell boundaries that are hyperbolas? And the last, yeah, this is, I'm still confused about this question. There are some cases where you don't really need to intersect with the space of spheres, that when you know the adjacency relationships um, for the faces of this polyhedron, that determines completely determines the adjacency relations for your Voronoi diagram. You don't actually need to intersect. You can just project. And I, there's some, I still don't exactly understand what separates those cases? Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I was going to say when I was preparing this, I was looking at an old version of this talk, and I we I'm working with Dave Blickenstein at Arizona right now, and we have made some progress on what used to be open questions to kind of try to take this method and generalize it to a larger class of functions, and then also what would happen if the sites are lines in R three. Um, can you use a convex hole approach to solve that? Okay. Well, thank you for your attention. Yeah. Yes. So, so you said that the medial axis of, say, a, a convex polygon was itself a Barnard diagram. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, maybe you mentioned this, uh, but I missed it. But uh, so is there like a reverse problem that if you have the Voronoi diagram, then you want to find the centers? Oh yeah, yeah. I know Dave Glickenstein has asked me that question, mm -hmm. um, and there are inverse problems. Like, given a a diagram, can you detect whether it is a Voronoi diagram or a power diagram? That kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I see. And then my second question was that so you take a convex polygon and then you take the medial axis and then take the centers of those. Does that have a name? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In relation to the polygon? Yeah, that's so that's another thing Dave and I have. Well, we talk about a lot of things we don't have any hope of understanding, but <laughs> one thing we've talked about is um, you have this polyhedron over in. Rd plus three, and the, the center that you're talking about exists on the polyhedron, but how can you translate properties of the polyhedron back to geometric properties in Rd? And so the answer to your question is, I don't know. But, okay. yeah, good question. I was also thinking of the sequence, like you could start with your points or whatever and get your Voronoi diagram, and then take each of the line segments, take the Voronoi diagram of that, and then... Mm -hmm. Get to the bar and day diagram of that, and then just I wonder if like it converges to some. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I mean, so people do try to approximate the medial axis for a curve yeah. by taking points.
closely spaced along the curve and then using the Voronoi diagram for those points to approximate the medial axis. But as Mohammed was saying before, this is a really unstable property that you can just perturb and then the qualitative properties of the medial axis change drastically under perturbation. This is maybe more a computational question than a geometry one, but you mentioned earlier the methods for computing these like roughly in the order of analog and mm -hmm. is there any conjecture is that is that possible or is that is I think that that's possible? Yeah, I think that's best possible. Mm -hmm. Suppose you pick the endpoints in R2, <clears throat> but you let this endpoint vary. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you configure the modular space of points in R2. And then for each given Set of endpoints, you have your Voronoi diagram, and you perturb them slightly. Mm -hmm. So I would say, as a generic choice of your set of endpoints, your Voronoi diagram may look the same in terms of mm -hmm. But then, when these endpoints may go to special positions, you may get that more special, more special mm -hmm. Voronoi diagram. Mm -hmm. It sounds like so. The modular space of endpoints in R two. Um, can also be decomposed into walls and chambers so that you can oh, yeah. put on a diagram for mm -hmm. your spaces. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah. So the structure of the Voronoi di diagram, like if you have points in general position, you mm -hmm. have hyperplanes in general position defining the polytope. And so you can refer, and I don't know this, this at all, this kind of uh, polytope geometry like Ziegler and um, geometry of um, hyperplanes in RN, but then you can count the generic number of, you know, degree of vertices and, you know, generic type, you know, so that results about generic or highly symmetric polytopes translate over to the Bornoy diagram. I'll make a comment. Mm -hmm. physicist here mm -hmm. uh in cosmology mm -hmm. people have used these Voronoi di diagrams to to study voids mm -hmm. in other words empty regions in between galaxy clusters so mm -hmm. there's quite a bit on that you could talk about the, the first known Voronoi diagram indeed it's a picture by Descartes where he draws a picture of the heavens and draws that Voronoi diagram you described around the stars. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? If not, let's look at this. 